Hello, everybody. My name is Ian Kirk Patty Hake. I'm an author, idiot, and loin streamer, and today is Lamoy time. It's the day about you. That's all we got for a theme song. Anyway, before we get started into that, the announcements. Number one, if you enjoy what I do on this channel, please remember to like, share, and subscribe for more. Maybe be involved in the uh, the events, which is number two. If you would like to be featured on the channel, there are two ways. Number one is Lemoine, which is what we are doing today. With I give you a prompt for the month. You write a short story or something, and uh, then the first Monday video of the month, we go through them together. The second way is if you are an indie author and you have a book published or a book coming out or multiple books you know, in a backlog, submit them to the Fresh Meat feature with your first chapter and your cover. They'll be read here on the channel, and hopefully that'll help more readers find your book because somebody is looking for it. They just don't know it yet. And then the third thing is if you would like to check out any of my books, they're available down in the, the, the description links and at any of your favorite retailers. So if you want to check those out. With that said, let's get into the submissions. Let's not waste too much time. Because you guys delivered, apparently, this is the kind of prompt that tickled y'all's pickle. Also, with that said, the new prompt for May is up. So if you want to be involved with May, which maybe you do, maybe you have some unresolved issues you would like to get out yourself. The May prompt is all about that. But this month is the reverse chosen one trope. You are the chosen one that was not chosen. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. We involve in that guy, right? You can like the one not picked for the team. And you're like, I don't want to be on the team anyway. The first story is by Allison Miller. Tessa had been in the facility. Marla and Alex had put her in for four days and has finally allowed telephone privileges. She got there early, skipping breakfast and lunch to get her turn. Her dad needed to know where she is, so he could come and get her. She was never speaking to Marla again. Friends don't 5150 other friends. When it was finally her turn to call her dad, letting him know everything. Dad, they put me in a facility. I don't know if you can get me out of here, but please try. I'm in Logan. I'm not crazy. I, no matter what they say. A hand grabbed hers. Tessa turned to be greeted by Sally Monson. The girl who gave her the name Stickbug stood in the way of the doors that she needed to enter and conspired to assault her with the friends. She was a nurse. Who gave this woman that much power? Wow, you've gotten taller. What are you, like six foot six? Six four. But that means I have been and always will be above you. With how you treat who you just spoke to, it's clear you think you're still above everybody. Then again, that's why mommy killed herself, isn't it? She was tired of having to deal with your prima donna act. Isn't this against some sort of HIPAA act for you to talk to me this way? Go fuck yourself, stickbug. Sally was leader of group the next day. Feigning sweetness, she said, Now, all of us here have an interesting backstory. Her voice was sickeningly sweet, like that of a first grade teacher about to tell of all of the mediocre students how special and important they are. Now, we all have a reason why we're here. Let's start with Tessa. My, oh my, isn't she tall? The people looked at Tessa as if she should be impressed with herself for being so tall. So skinny, too, Sally said. Maybe that's why she's here. Let's see, Sally said, opening Tessa's folder. This woman loved violating her own rules. Subject was found in a room in her house, appearing to have broken her own hand. Tessa was up and looming over Sally. Undisturbed, Sally continued. Subject was also found to be lying about her broken bones and was found like her mommy. Pills and alcohol everywhere. Tessa grabbed the file, rolled it up, and hit Sally across the face with it. Tessa couldn't fight. It was something that she knew from many times of trying. Sally stood up and asked her to go sit back down. Tessa took the file and ripped it in half, quite impressed that she got through so many pages. Sally had to wrangle it out of her hands, giving Tessa a paper cut in the process. Sit down, Sally roared. The stinging of her paper cut made Tessa realize she was bleeding. It was in the spot between a thumb and an index finger right in the crease. Tessa squeezed the blood out and rubbed it on Sally's mouth. Sharp needles penetrated Tessa's back and volts of electricity shot through her. She convulsed a while, the orderly having his finger on a trigger until a girl shrieked at them to stop. Tessa fell to the ground. The only thing about being in here was Claudia's confined her. 
dreams of her father plagued Tessa the entire time that she was medicated. He wandered around, scowling at her. When he turned to walk away from her, half of his head was missing. He dismissively waved his hand at her, missing the three middle fingers. That's all he did on a loop. Tessa was barely coming out of her drugged-up stupor when she had a phone call. Assuming that it was Marla, she answered, What do you want now? Only breathing in the other end. Marla, tell me what you want. It's not Marla. C Cece? No. Don't say my name. I don't want them to keep you in there longer than they are. Sitting down in the corner, she asked him, How are you doing this? He made a lot of shuffling noises on the other end. Sally, it's her phone. What did you do? I think you know what I did. Why? His chair creaked as he adjusted nervously. I want to be whole again, and I'm almost there. Tessa slumped down to the little bench near the phone. What are you going to do with your... Tessa looked around and checked her emotions, knowing her conversation was being monitored if not recorded. When I am... When I am whole, I... He didn't finish his sentence. I want to be with you. I called because I want to hear your voice as closely as I can without the distortion of our worlds colliding. Why? Tessa asked, tears in her eyes. Why me? You read the books. You walked down the trail and you found my picture. You are connected to me. I don't want this connection anymore. I may be able to leave once I'm on the other side and free, but this will always be with you. It has been with you since my mother. Yes. And if you come with me, you and I will be greater than we've ever been. You will be more than Marla, Alex, and your family, even more than me. We can be great together. I have such things to show you. Tessa pressed her lips together and put her lower lip in her teeth. I know what you're doing right now. She wiped her eyes and said, You know nothing about me. When you want to cry, but you feel like you can't... Su when you want to cry, but you feel like you can't, you press your lips together. When that doesn't work, you chew on your lower lip, trying not to let your words slip. You did it with Adrena all the time. How have you been watching me? He didn't answer. Don't find me. I don't want you anymore. I'm trying to think. This feels like if we go, not the beginning of the story, but maybe like the end of the first act or the start of the first act, where she's already been through something, already found something, already been used somewhat for this chosen one, and is kind of in the outs with everybody. There's great scene setting in here. Great, super great tension, Allison. The next story is by Groovy Kawaii. The next story is by Kawaii Groovy Cat. Not one of the last ones to be read today. <laughs> so congratulations on getting your submission in fairly early. I've never been the good Catholic boy my mother tried to raise me to be, nor am I even particularly religious. I don't believe in silly things like destiny, and I don't think fate is set in stone. But I have always believed in God. Because how could things turn out to be this bad if some old man upstairs wasn't actively making it so? Look, I knew exactly what I was signing up for when I agreed to work graveyard shifts at Lanuit alone. I know the appeal of a 24-7 coffee shop, even one located at the top of an adult bookstore. Barely anyone comes in here the early hours of the morning unless it's finals week, so I pretty much get paid to do my homework and not be bothered by anyone. Didn't need sleep anyway. So this is great. Wonderful. I jerked awake with a quickness that left me nauseous. Way too dizzy to be waking up in bed. On the floor... Th what the hell was I up to last night? Surely I wasn't drinking last night. This didn't feel like a hangover, so that was ruled out. Flobbered over the head then? Nah, that couldn't be it either. I didn't feel any sort of pain in my head, so I probably wasn't injured there. I surveyed my surroundings. The carpet underneath me was patterned, soft. I was still in my uniform, apron and napkins and all. I looked fine enough, so I probably didn't get into a fight. My head was starting to clear up ever so slightly, and I didn't necessarily feel sick, so with all of those options ruled out, the only thing that I could think of that made a little bit of sense was... I probably got roofied or something. Hooray for the Lanuit employee's discount, am I right? Great. Wonderful. Definitely not getting kidnapped or murdered tonight. Ugh. I started actually feeling sick. If my sister somehow crawled out of the Italian hellhole that she came from and managed to find me, no. 
that probably wasn't it. This city was way too big for the socially anxious 20-something immigrant to be found so easily. And it wasn't like I left any footprints behind when I ran away. Okay, just stay calm. Let's just figure out the sit rep, as Hunter would call it. On the floor, definitely not in Lanuit. It didn't have carpets this nice. Maybe the bookstore downstairs? God, I hope this carpet's clean. Probably got drugged. I tried to reach for my phone, only to find that I couldn't move my hand. Odd. I shifted my head to see what was holding my hand back. Handcuffs. Pinky, but not something that I was into. The rest of me, oddly enough, wasn't tied up. Not that it really mattered. Just keep calm. Everything's fine. Only panic if you want to die. Sure, things were pretty bad, and it looked like I was pretty screwed, but I'd survived worse when I was younger. I heard footsteps coming my way. They were agonizingly slow compared to the beating of my heart. A shadow fell over me. Or rather, a woman stood over me, staring at me without a hint of emotion on her face or life in her sky-blue eyes. Shit. There were few things in the world that were scarier than women. After living with them my whole childhood, I never managed to get acclimated to them or the way that they functioned. Still, she wasn't saying anything. Damn it. Was I supposed to speak up first? Keep it together, man. It couldn't have been that hard to figure out something to say. Not when I had so many thoughts rushing through my head. Uh, I began. What the hell is going on? Who the hell are you? Let me go right now, or even, what the hell do you think you're doing to me like this, you creepy bitch? Those were all perfectly good and serviceable options. So why then, out of all of those? H hi? Did, um, did you, um, need something from me? Was that what I chose to say? I would have slapped myself if I hadn't been handcuffed. You idiot. Don't be fooled by her black, not very blonde hair. This woman probably wanted to kill you, and instead of yelling at her for somehow managing to roof you, even though you were all alone, you say that? The woman tilted her head, almost as though she were amused by what I had just said, but her expression remained set in stone. Nicolo Agnetti. She said. That is your name. Correct. Shit, shit, shit. How the hell did she? Oh my fucking god, don't tell me. Great, wonderful. My family probably sent this woman to find me and kidnap me and kill me and transport my corpse back home. No, everything was fine. I was okay. I would be okay. All I had to do was cooperate. Maybe I could reason with her to let me go. Uh, y y yes, I replied. But how, how did, how, um, um, how did you know, um, my name? I have heard many a thing about you, she replied, but most notably that the blood of the malevolent runs in your veins. The, the malevolent? Uh, what the hell was this woman on and where could I get some? I was going to need it after this shit show, assuming I survived. Who? The malevolent, the woman replied. A divine evil thought to have been vanquished thousands of years ago, but... His bloodline remained. Um, I, I'm sorry, but, um, I, st I stammered. I, I, I don't, I don't quite understand what, what you're, um, what you're getting at. The woman only rolled her eyes and produced a knife from behind her. Let me explain it in a way that even you can understand. Your grandpa's an evil god and I've been sent to kill you. Ah, there was no way God wasn't real. He had to be, in order for my life to have turned out the way that it did. Destiny was a stupid concept, but I refuse to believe that God hasn't been screwing with me all of this time just to watch me suffer. And this was no different. This, this insane bitch, who indubitably was part of some creepy messed up cult just casually decided to kidnap some random Italian guy and stab the shit out of him, said random guy being me... Uh, 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 with, with all due respect, uh, if, if you, if you know who, who, um, who I am, I said, uh, th then why pick me first? I, um, my family is, uh, is, uh, in Italy. Why not, uh, go, go after them if, uh, th this is really what you're here for? Trust me, kid, the woman said. They're next, but you're the easiest target. 
She knelt down beside me. I tried to kick her, to shift back, to stand up, but all I succeeded in doing was hitting my head hard against something wooden. All I could do from then on was watch her, dazed, with stars clouding my vision. The woman's expression morphed into something that I could have sworn was solemn for a moment before returning to nonchalance. I'm sorry, she muttered. I really am, you know. This isn't anything personal, and I will no rudge upon you for the sins of your lineage, but you still need to die. And then she stabbed me in the side, and I felt nothing. All I could do was stare at her. You know, books, TV shows, movies, anime, none of it ever properly represented what being stabbed felt like. A character could get shot by a gun four times and have half of their tendons sliced up by a sword, but still be able to stand and fight with the power of friendship. I hated violence. I hated the sight of blood. I hated holding weapons in my hands, and most of all, I hated getting stabbed. It can't just hurt once. Oh no. That's not enough pain. It always hurts worse when she pulled the knife out. The sound was even worse. It hurt. It hurt. I immediately scrambled to cover the wound, forgetting for a moment that I was handcuffed. I could see the blood from the wound, even after my vision started fading in and out. I'd bled before, but it never prepared me for just how much blood could leave the body from one stab wound. What's... The woman whispered. What's wrong with me? This was supposed to be quick. She shook her head, her breath shaky. Don't start thawing out now, Aster. You're going to forget this voice so soon as you leave. Just, just do it. So that was her name. Knowing it brought me an unlikely sense of comfort. At least I would know who killed me. And then a gunshot rattled the room and it wasn't from her. Too slow. Aster hissed under her breath. She looked me in the eye again. I'm coming back for you later. And then she was gone, and my visions were finally failing me, like the rest of my body. The pain was becoming distant, replaced by a chill that resounded all the way down my bones. Ah, this was what it felt like to die. Hey. I wasn't sure why that voice sounded so familiar to me. I know it hurts, but I'll handle this. Just go back to sleep. Whoever said those words must have known what they were talking about. Of course, I obeyed them. I mean, if this was just going to be this character dying in this story, I like, I, Ruby Cat, I love your narrative voice is what I really want to say. I just, in general, when you're writing, I, oh my gosh. I, uh, but if this was going to be just a short of like somebody being the chosen one and just stabbed and getting and dying, I've been like, this is perfectly contained. I am perfectly content with this. But then, you know, he's getting saved at the end. So that's not where it goes. So it's like, oh, there's, there's, there's more to this. Also fair and good. <laughs> you always have such a fun playfulness to the way that you write. I love it. The next story is by Gao Chan. Cabin Folks 2. All right, all right, calm down. Seeing that the two strange women were freaking out, Coleman Becker raised his voice and put his arms up. We don't mean you any harm, okay? We're just here to hide from the snow. Oh, we get a continuation from the cabin? Ecow. It's not that, sir. In just this moment, Jay came between Jesse, Chloe, and the other mountaineer, holding the Jade Buddha pendant on his neck. It's, it's complicated. Do you know anything about time travel? What does that even mean? Becker frowned. You're saying that you're from the future. Tom adjusted his glasses. No. Well, yes. Jay shook his head. We, our team is more than 30 years after yours. I, I can't really explain, but, uh, what happened to us? Steve interjected. You've clearly heard of us. What happened here? I, 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 Jay stammered, not knowing how to answer. Did I die here? Becker asked with a heavy frown. Chloe, Jesse, and Jay went silent. No one answered. I see. Becker rubbed his temples. I died here. What happened? You're from the future, right? Tell me what happened. By the decree of Mother of Flesh, all anguish shall end. Just this moment, Charlie, Carl, and Stephen chanted at the same time. W what are you doing? Becker was quite perturbed, and he tried to walk over to Charlie. The Mother of Flesh decreed, all anguish shall end. The three chanted again, with smiles on their faces and their eyes unfocused. Before anyone could say or do anything, their bodies started shriveling and drying up. Their eyes were sucked into the sockets, their mouths open wide. Within a few seconds, three living men turned into standing mummies in mountain gear. 
What the fuck? Becker fell into the ground and started cursing. In a mere moment, screams, chaos, and fear filled the entire cabin. Everyone rushed to the windows and the door, trying to break them and escape. Nothing worked. The thin glasses of the window show no sign of damage, even at the repeated bashing of climbing picks. The wooden door wouldn't budge, even when Becker and Jay almost dislocated their shoulders. Desperation set in. Along with exhaustion and physical pain, Tom and Carolyn held each other. While curling up in the corner, Becker grunted as he rubbed his right shoulder. Leaning on the wall, Chloe and Jesse were weeping helplessly on their long chair beside the window. And Jay, knuckles and shoulders bruised and sore, still tried to catch his breath. The Buddha pendant on his necklace was tingling and getting warm. He just did not have the heart to pay it attention. Tell me what happened. With a short hiss from his moving shoulders, Becker looked Jay in the eyes. You said that you're from the future. Tell me what happened. Jesse and Chloe had their eyes fixed on Jay. I, well, Jay stammered, still not knowing how to respond. He thought that he'd know what to do in this situation, but the fact was, he did not. It's not fate, Tom sniffled. Becker and Jay both turned their eyes on Tom. Even if they are from the future, what happened in their history is still not fate, Tom clarified, then tried to stand up. I refuse to believe this. I agree, Jay added. He was not fully convinced. He just needed to believe. Okay. Tom took a deep breath. Now, let's just think and figure out a way. He abruptly stopped while slowly turning his face up to the ceiling. Uh, what? What? Carolyn asked. Did you hear that? Y you Chloe asked with a trembling voice. You heard it too? What are you saying? Jesse screeched at Chloe. What are you saying? The Master of Blood commanded. All that would fade shall be conserved. Jesse and Tom shivered and whispered at the same time. Jesse screamed and tried to back away from Chloe, while Carolyn held on to Tom and tried to shake him out of his trance. But in the next moment, they seemed to be hearing something from above as well and somehow started levitating. While Jesse and Tom were completely frozen in their positions, Carolyn and Jesse laughed frantically, floating toward the ceiling. The King of Tendons ruled. All of ours shall be dispersed. Bones and flesh cracked, Carolyn and Jesse's bodies exploded into thousands of small pieces and shot out in every direction. The pieces, however, did not touch anything or any one inside of the cabin, but simply passed through the walls and ceiling and disappeared. Becker was stunned from one moment, then rushed to Jay, grabbed him by the collar, and slammed him into the wall. He spit all over Jay's face. Tell me what happened! Now! We all died. Jay felt his lips and tongues were no longer his. We all died. But why? Why? Becker yelled. I don't know. Jay almost whimpered. How? How, how, can, how can anyone know? Smoke rose from Jay's collar. Something burned Becker's hand and forced him to let go of Jay. What is this? Becker grunted as his hands were red from his heat. What did you? Before he could say anything else, his eyes glowed in a haunting gray and orange light with bizarre change in his expression. He chanted, Queen of Mora willed it. All tissue of life shall be offered. Jay felt his entire body shackle, and a horrifying power seeped into his body. Something, or someone, was trying to speak to him. A chilling message. But he could not hear it. The Queen of Morrow willed it. All tissues of life shall be offered. Becker tried to grab Jay once again, but his entire body collapsed from inside before he could, leaving a pile of skin and clothing on the ground. An extreme heat arose from Jay's blood, muscle, and even bones. He wanted to make a sound, yet his lungs and throat wouldn't work. His vision went dark. After an unknown length of time, eyes opened. It did not know what happened. It did not know who it was. What it was. It just knew that it was suffering, and thanks to an artifact memorializing Buddha, it was able to survive. Its body was made of black, reflective, and elastic materials and was put on a coat hanger. There was a man sleeping in its side. It looked in the mirror. Its body took a full human shape, but hollow. It had holes in its face where eyes and a mouth should be, and it could see, hear, and sense the surroundings just the same. It was exhausted. It could not think. Sleepiness overwhelmed it. Everything seemed like it was going to be different. Is this... Is this... Is this a Gimp Man story? Origin story? Is Gimp Man traveling 
through everything and knows the the Becker man, Egal. I mean, it sounds it sounds like the Gimp man. I love that you did a continuation from last week, and you also like merge different things that have come up in different ways in this area, bro. Your stories are so fun. The next story is by Toasty Marsh, our very own trash panda. You are not special. The only words that I ever hyperfocus on. In the moment when I am facing certain death in the face, the room made out of black marble with only blue lights to help us see a small blue stone that sits on a simple black stand in the middle, guarded by a creepy looking fellas that prowls the room like a cat. It knows someone is here. Yet I choose to selfishly focus on the words that were not said, but instead how the truth made me feel. I didn't notice that it was eating away at me until I realized that my reckless action was putting me and my twin sister in danger, but she'll be fine. She is the one who's destined to control the very creature that guards the stone and whom have hunted humanity down for many years. But I can't help but wish that she was never chosen. That whole thing was a hoax to simply give people hope and or to just give the task to someone else, anyone, just as long as I didn't have this bitter emptiness that grows heavier in my chest. The creature's dark eyes scan the room, its movements smooth at the patterns of its shiny light brown coat is almost mesmerizing. I kneel down, resting my hands on the cold black marble tiles. I need to get to that stone to prove everyone wrong that the chosen one was all nonsense. But first, I had to distract the fellas. I can feel Odell glaring at me as if I was the one who purposefully dragged her to the cold, dimly lit room. Roger looks unusually nervous for a robot. He has his teal LED lights dimmed down to not cause unwanted attention. Please, ladies, I beg we dispute this discussion in the safety of the headquarters. He says with a voice turned down low for only us to hear. But neither of us was listening to the robot. Aubrey... We need to leave, Odell hisses at me. Don't do something you'll regret. I make a hushing sound, dismissing her demands. I do not want to listen to her. For once, she's going to experience what it feels like to be ignored. I am going to prove all of you wrong, I whisper back, not looking at her. From my left pocket, I grab a laser pointer. The fellas are known to have similarities to cats, slender bodies, and round dark eyes, though they don't have the same biology as one. It's been told that they have cat-like mannerisms. I point the laser far away from the stone, and to my surprise, my assumptions were correct. Just like cats, they'll hunt anything that moves. As the fellas pounces toward the little red dot, I take the chance and sprint to the stone as fast as I can. Odell tries to stop me. I can hear her curse under her breath as she fails. I can hear my heart beat in my ears. I can feel the adrenaline going through my body. I'm going to get it. I'm going to do it. I grab the stone and without warning, white hot pain goes through my body as if something injected lava into my veins and a booming unknown voice echoes in my head. You're not the chosen one. Poor guy. Poor, poor Aubrey. I could see. Oh, I love this so much. I love the dynamic of these characters and the choice of having the perspective of being the one that was not the chosen one being next to the chosen one. Dude, I love this. The tension, the characters. I, but I love this, Marshy. You're a good trash panda. The next story is by our very own whole daddy, Mike Venus. I don't know why I say it like that. I just do. I really hate this shitty newsreel nightly. Why do we have to watch this garbage every single night? It's the same thing over and over again. Thad was right. The news never changed. Global cooling had finally stopped. The deserts of the world had returned to their pre-ice normal tropical temperatures. The country had squashed its little skirmish with the Bahamas and now controlled entire Caribbean oceans again, and the populations and the population levels were almost even. The best news of all was that the brainstem tremor pandemic population numbers had leveled off to 50%. His observations, while true, weren't popular. The newsreel team of Jacory Fillmore, the Trevor Oswald, and Endora Murray assaulted every household in the United Federation of Americanda on a twice nightly basis, all from the same comfort of your own private but government controlled S2 polyjector. 
I didn't like watching those three asshats any more than Thad did, but they weren't going away anytime soon. In fact, I hated watching them. Every person, no matter their age, gender, or social status, was watching their S2 polyjectors at the very moment. No one was exempt. From the zipway janitor standing on the corner all of the way to the presidential triad, it was mandatory entertainment. All three were crap. Chikori was an ex-sports baller turned newscaster. He knew everything about sports, including things from games that no longer existed. He would throw in references to ball bases and baskets, something like that. I never did find out who LeBron Jordan was, but whatever sport it was had been disbanded more than 450 years ago. It really doesn't matter now. Only a handful of those old-timers were left now. The others had died from extreme old age. His cockiness knew no boundaries. Trevor Oswald was the smart one. He could name all 125 presidents from before, when we were just the United States, not including Americanda. He also knew all 153 of the triadinal presidents, a fact that he could sprinkle into the newscast at least once a night. He was obnoxious and thought of himself better than everyone, which to most he was. Endura Murray was the worst. Her long legs and tan skin were the envy of women, men, and most polygenders across the nation. Her hair was the most expensive blonde platinum the UFA network could buy. She had been voted the most glamorous person on the planet three consecutive times. She's everything that I'm not. She is, in my opinion, also the stupidest person alive. If either of those two beside her asked her a question, her answer was always the same. I'll be right back, Jack or whatever, Trevor. Her catchphrases were on the electro board advertisement along the zipways and the officially approved government songs on Radio Free UFA and t-shirts. I had one custom made for Thad from the bootleg t-shirt guy down the street. It was Adora, smiling and waving to whoever, saying, that's not bad, Thad. I got it for him last winter during a Black Friday holiday. He hated it. I knew he would. Shh, come on, Thad. Just sit through it and be quiet. I don't want to end up on a brick detail again because of you. The last time we carted so many that I had blisters for a month. He would remember. He ended up with the same punishment as me. It was his fault anyway. On the Newsreel Nightly episode, he made the mistake of blurting in the middle of the S2 polyjector telecast about Endora's brand new boob job, her third. Hey, Endora, wanna show the pups third time's a charm? It was my fault for laughing, and a very good thing for us that the sound monitors had been left off that night. When Endora hears audience remarks that don't compliment her, she gets very upset. A readjustment patrol usually arrives shortly after. Sorry, Mary Beth, I won't get us in this shit tonight. I'm kinda down about the upcoming raffle anyway. I hate it. I knew what he meant. The idea behind it was horrid. The only saving grace for me, I was what the government now called an unrelated person. A huge and official sounding title for someone who had no living family members. I know, bro. It sucks for the people who get secondhand picked. Imagine how bad it would be to be pickers, though. Having to choose a family member for the unlife event? Ugh. Makes me glad that I'm unrelated. Yeah. I just hope that I don't get drawn. I won't be able to nominate Tushy. I'd go myself and dare them to take her. Trudy Givens. Tushy, was Thad's eight-year-old baby sister, his only living relative and biggest fan. She worshipped him like only a little sister could. He would never send her. About halfway through the newsreel cast, a special bulletin flashed. It wasn't unusual to see. There was almost always something extra going on that the public at large would be interested in. This one was for designer cuppies. Somehow, scientists had manipulated DNA for cats and dogs to create a new species. The genetic manipulation industry was booming because of it. It's the newest big thing. Only rich people could afford one. I'd never even seen one. Jacory, we have a special bulletin for the audience. Trevor was center stage. He was the only one of the three who had any intelligence, or so it seemed. The other two were eye candy. I wondered aloud if anybody else felt the same. Thad... Do you think that people look at the S2 and wonder if they're being played for idiots, or do they just soak it all up? The question had been bothering me for some time. I knew our history, and I knew the current situation, but the newsreel team never addressed anything other than happy chipper news. The brainstem tremor virus, or, as we all call it here, the rails were killing the country. Anytime I saw a newsreel, I thought that I was being lied to. It was so confusing. Coverage usually talked about how under control everything was. It's not. I'd seen it attack the brainstem and cause it to shake, sometimes violently, sometimes not. 
but eventually it's always fatal. The brain convulses so hard that it gives you something called an internal decapitation. Tushy has it. Thad doesn't. Neither do I. I've heard rumors of a cure, but so far nothing has been pushed out to the masses. We all just have to wait to catch it. Just as I asked the question, in what I thought was a relatively low whisper, I saw the eyes of Trevor look straight into the S2. Mary Elizabeth Grace, 118 East River Street, Freeport, Lexington, reports to the nearest readjustment center for re-education tomorrow at 8 a.m. Ah, shit. Looks like you did it again, dingbat. The look from Thad told me that he was sorry. He knew my second time around was not to be so gentle as the brick pile. This time I could expect a little more. Thaddeus Gibbons, same address. You report as well. A wicked smirk from Trevor shined across his polyjection. This gives me vibes, like, in a really good way. I don't know if there's a bad way for this vibe. But, uh, Harrison Bergenon and Hunger Games. Like, at the same, well, at least the first Hunger, the first section of the first Hunger Games. At the same time, because obviously we got the picker thing where somebody is nominated and then you have to, or somebody is picked and then you have to nominate a family member. So there's that. But also, this is the Harrison Bergenon with, like, the watching of the TV and seeing kind of this dystopian society through the watching of the TV and through the interaction of these people sitting there watching. Bro, this is great. I would love to see this lengthened to get, like, a little more of the in with the universe to see more of it playing out to then end on that note. I know that I gave you, like, a very crunched time. So, like, you really couldn't do much more with this. I assume that it's kind of pushing the limits because it's fairly long. But I would love to see more on this. Not a full, like, I think that this could be a really good short story. Thank you, sir, for your submission. The next story is by Jim Terry. I think this is your first time being featured in Lemoy. So thank you, Jim Terry, and welcome to the mistakes. The operational recruit, the title. He stood in the open field, facing the enemies of the squad that recruited him just hours before. Potions sloshed in a small bottle, loosely dangling from his grip as his mind swirled with it. What the heck am I doing here? An elegant woman named Lithia led the small army of five and stood in the middle of her four companions. Sitting quietly on his tall black steed in front of her was Blazer, while Anthem and Grillis, a mage and a brute, flanked her sides. Behind them all was Dave. Plain, matted hair. Doctor in training, Dave. Their squad attacked the foes in turns. Gillis sliced the nearest one with his blade, blood splattered all over him. He smeared it across his bare chest as a warning to the others that ahead of them. Balazer followed up with a pole arm to the skull of an enemy slightly further away as Lithia, Anthem, and Dave merely moved forward, the leader quite a bit separate from everyone else. She's out in the open. What does she think she's doing? Dave tried to step forward to warn her, but his legs wouldn't move. He grunted and groaned, prompting Anthem to look behind her. As he attempted to lift his right legs with his hand, he whispered, I can't seem to move. It's not our turn, Anthem answered. We are in the middle of a battle and we're taking turns? She's in plain view of everyone. She can take it. Are you kidding me? Look. She's our leader. We do not question what the divinity does. If she is attacked and needs you to heal her, you just do it. Swinging one of her golden braids behind her shoulder, Anthem faced forward again. Her book suddenly floated with an orange aura above her right hand. Arrows flew toward Lithia. Though she didn't move an inch, they all missed her anyway. The divinity. What does that even mean? An opposing mage took his stance against Anthem, who blasted him with a fireball and watched as Balazair finished him off with a stab through the neck as he lifted into the air, decapitated. Holy shit! Dave croaked on the brink of vomiting. That's blasphemous? Anthem spat with a sideways glare that pierced through Dave as easily as Balazair's polearm. In the presence of the divinity, we watch our tongues. When she looked away again, Dave mocked her through flared nostrils and silently flapping lips. The remaining enemies slashed, swung, and speared at Lithia and Grillis. While they continued each blow with one of their own, they both bled from their injuries and curved from the onslaught. Ready to finish them off, what remained of the opposition approached them. Belazare's horse galloped ahead of Lithia to block a direct attack from her oncoming foes. Anthem found her place behind Gillis, torching an enemy who came too close. The divinity needs a heal, newcomer. Anthem instructed, weighing the swarm of soldiers waiting to mow Lithia down. Dave chose to mend the equally bloody Grillis instead of, and offered him a drink without thanks in return. Balazare has this covered. He hasn't been struck yet. 
The area was shrouded in darkness. Dave and others stood in all emptiness. All sound was echoless. The ground was there, with no sense of depth. You idiot, she needed a heal, not Gorillus. He can take one more hit as long as he's alert, and he there's only one person close enough to strike him, Anthem said. What happened? Dave asked. The divinity died, of course. Holy shit, blasphemer! I am, um, I, I, I don't know what to do. Just stop. The pinwheel will bring her back. Dave wasn't quite finished feeling sorry for the disaster he bestowed upon himself, the party, or the world until he blinked. Excuse me? The divine pinwheel. We explained it when we recruited you. Did you hear anything that we said? No. Not a word. Of course, the pinwheel, Dave said as convincingly as he could. Anthem sighed. Even though he couldn't hear her, he knew her hand was over her face when the volume of her sigh suddenly dropped to one that wasn't as humiliating. The world became bright again. The breeze flowed through Dave's unbrushed hair as Lithia was back. The divinity was back. Praise be the divinity, he shouted unwillingly with the others. He used both hands to cover his mouth and stared intensely at Anthem's direction. For once, she didn't respond. When he was able to move his legs, Dave recalled his orders from before. Heal Lithia, the divinity, that one. He approached her with a potion and gauze, hoping Balazar would protect him too. When he reached out his hand, Lithia said and did nothing. In response, Dave fumbled his equipment. In response, Dave fumbled with his equipment as he applied it to her with no help from anyone else. There, he finished. Though he was surprised by how potent his potions were, he admired Lithia's perfection and his own job well done. His lapse of attention caused his empty bottle to fall from his hand and shatter on the stone conveniently level to his feet. Hmm? Grillus grunted in Dave's direction, and before he could tell Grillus to look out, a sword pierced his chest, killing him instantly. No, 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 no! He was supposed to survive! Anthem wailed. Dave looked at Balazar, angrily mowing down any enemy who approached. It was quite different from before the world turned black. Lithia, as always, stood with a blank stare, ready to counter when provoked, but even more ready to allow the others to do the job instead. Can't the pinwheel bring him back? As hard as he tried to be hopeful. Nerves took over. He couldn't help but shiver. Any patience that Anthem had for the new doctor dissolved in that instance. Does he look divine to you? It only works when this happens to Lithia, you fool. So we are risking our lives for an immortal woman that even time bends to? Why can't she do it herself? But before Anthem could respond, an arrow spiraled toward Dave's face. I love this. As like, I really, really love this being not the chosen one and this perspective of being somebody who is by the chosen one, or this could even be an RPG character. I could be dumb and this could be, I mean, I amped up, but this could be an RPG character, like being in a game and the NPCs looking at the player character and being like, uh, but I love this with the perspective of Dave. It's so much fun as the surrounding characters to the chosen one, my guy. Thank you for submitting this. The next story is by Apra Ash, called The Dark Banisher. Old Man Jenkins arranged the counter of his shop as quickly as he could, setting the prices just a little lower and putting his best items in the more obvious spots. It sounded like bad business practice, and on any other day, it would be. But today, the Dark Banisher approached. Sixteen years ago, the Prophet of Mount Inva descended from the mountains and proclaimed that the Age of Darkness was coming to an end, that the Dark Banisher would usher in an Age of Light. A boy was born that could bring down the Dark Lord, though... He must not know his destiny too early, but all should help him along his path to glory. She traveled from town to town, but ultimately made the mistake of going to Trebalia, capital of the Golden Empire. The Emperor's black guard scooped up the prophet from the streets and made an example of her. Public beatings followed by a slow and painful execution, but she died with a smile on her face, 
her faith unbroken. Then, a year ago, new rumors began to circulate amongst the merchants and travelers. Tales of a boy who survived his village burnt by the Dark Lord's minions setting up as a merchant, going from town to town, selling what he could, but also solving all of their problems. In a die, he had been carrying the exact plant in large quantities to cure the spreading illness. In Vessel, he'd brought them just enough metal to forge a new part of their windmill so that they could produce food. In Chassel, he had been wearing a silver chain that protected him from the curse and had a wagon full of flame water, which he used to burn the altar of the Dark Lord, which had been causing the problems. He was a hero. He's here! shouted someone outside, and Jenkins made his final adjustments. A few minutes later, he heard a wagon stop outside. Then, his door opened. He was a young man, the Dark Vanisher. At sixteen, he was quite tall, his broad shoulders and a thick mop of dirty blonde hair. His eyes were relaxed and bright blue. He wore a simple garb, a tunic, sturdy trousers, and a long coat, all in various shades of deep brown. Greetings, said Jenkins. Welcome to my shop. What can I do for you today? A man said that you were the wholesaler in this town. Is that right? Asked the Dark Banisher, his voice deep beyond his years, strong and firm, yet showing a kind heart behind it. This boy was already a man. It is. It is. Tell me what you've got. Jenkins took a list and read through it, though started up some idle chatter to fill the silence. Been on the road long, young man? About a year now. My father always said that I should be humble, but I think I'm doing well for myself. It's been hard going, but I'm still here. Oh, run into trouble? I've seen some of the things the Empire has done. The boy said with a sad nod. All people had seen that, and it was never pretty. The Dark Lord seemed to want his empire on the very edge of survival, with how often farms were burned. But that's not going to stop me going to the capital. I got wares to sell, you know? Oh, I know very well. He was going to slay the Dark Lord. Going to take down the competition, are you? Yeah. I'll show the Dark Lord some real gold by the end of it. <laughs> the boy had a beautiful laugh. I've been told some people may be willing to help me make it big. I'm surprised so many people out in the villages know the big city merchants. The name I heard the most was Valerius, so I guess I'll go find him first. He's apparently a priest, so I'm not sure why he'd help me sell, but I'll give him a shot. Valerius was known as the Underman of Light. He was a token holy man that the Dark Lord allowed so that the masses still had a little hope, so that they'd keep working. Jenkins had seen him speak ten years prior. He had true faith in the fight of Fae, and if there was anyone who could help the Dark Bannister ascend to his destiny, it was that priest. He sounds like the right man for you to see, said Jenkins. He put little circles next to the items that he wanted to buy and handed the list back. Just name your price, even if it took him out of pocket. He'd give the man the money to reach Volzarius. If the Empire was gone, life would be so much sweeter. The Dark Banisher had to succeed. I can't say it enough. I love these stories that are from the perspective of watching, like, seeing the Chosen One and the different ways to interpret the Chosen One. Like, that, it's a kind of, it's almost like, if, as, if we're talking NPCs, it's almost like looking at the main character through the NPCs, but better. It's so much fun. You guys are great. Thank you for submitting, Ash. The next story is by R.S. Alessi. Martin didn't have time to play diplomat for aliens. Oh no. He had a full day ahead of him. Taxes to file, a license to renew, a crime to report. But when the frog-like creature waddled onto the shoulder and directly into his path, he had to stop or run it over. He chose to squeeze the brakes hard, bringing his bike to a halt. He wasn't a savage. Greetings, Martin. We come in peace, the alien said. A dozen more of the slimy bug-eyed creatures milled about in the wildflowers bordering the country lane. They ranged in skin tones from blue to pink. The one speaking to him was a lovely shade of lavender. I shouldn't have eaten those eggs for breakfast, he muttered, wheeling his bike past the squat, warty creature. None of them were larger than a fire hydrant, and he noticed that they had six limbs instead of four. The lime green uniforms they wore clashed with their natural coloring. Eggs always disagree with me. Oh, wait, we come in. He didn't stop. No more eggs for me. His taxes were not filed quickly or easily. He argued with his accountant over several deductions he'd claimed and got what he wanted. Push hard and don't give an inch. That's what it took to get ahead in this world. He hummed to himself as he unlocked his bike from the bike rack. 
That morning air was warm, promising afternoon heat. Hopefully, he'd be home before it arrived. He was halfway to the city clerk's office when the police cars raced down the highway toward him, dozens of them sirens blaring. They roared past, cars had pulled over, motorists stopping and staring, but he rode on. That fishing license wouldn't renew itself. He liked to fish on Sundays. Most weekdays, he brought home a few trout. Fried up in butter, they were his favorite meal. He arrived at the city clerk's office and secured his bike to a tree. Young hoodlums were everywhere these days. He paid good money for his bike, money he'd saved from his pension, and he wasn't going to let hoodlums steal his bike and pawn it for dope. The city clerk's office desk was empty of the receptionist, who should have been waiting to take his money and renew his license. He frowned. The building had been remodeled a few years ago, hallways and individual offices removed to create an open floor plan. For better transparency, the mayor said at the ribbon-cutting ceremony, which meant Martin could see all of the city employees crowded around a nearby desk, shouting over one another and pointing at a monitor. He tapped the bell on the service desk. Excuse me! None of the employees noticed. He tried again, this time a little louder. Excuse me. Still nothing. Excuse me. A woman in a pencil skirt brushed past him. He grabbed her arm. I'd like to renew my... Can't you see that we have an emergency? She asked. He squared his shoulders. I can see that no one's interested in doing their jobs. I'd like to renew my fishing license, if you don't mind. We're in the middle of an invasion, and you're concerned about your fishing license? Yes. She yanked free and hustled over to the other employees, where she joined them in shouting and pointing. Useless bureaucrats. He'd come back later, he decided, as he unlocked his bike. The ride from the city clerk's office to the police station was a pleasant one. Leafy oaks, neatly manicured lawns, and sprawling Victorian mansions. Martin, stop! He skidded to a halt before a pair of frog creatures, one pink and one magenta. Martin, stop! He skidded to a halt before a pair of frog creatures, one pink, the other magenta. They were smaller specimens the size of bowling balls. Whatever you're selling, he said, I'm not interested. We come in peace. We need to. Not interested. He stood on the pedals and nearly ran them over. A few minutes later, he arrived at the police station. With his bike secured, he walked inside, ready to file his complaint. No good hoodlums with their baseball bats joyriding at night had busted down his mailbox, and replacing it would cost him money from his already too slim pension. Not an officer was in sight. He stood at the front desk for a five full minutes, but no one appeared. Huh. No point in waiting. He left. Outside, a teenager in a hoodie crouched over Martin's bike, fiddling with the lock. Martin ran toward him. Hey, get away from that! The teen jumped back, hands raised, eyes wild. On dope, no doubt. Didn't you hear? The teen said. Aliens landed not far from here. Guns don't work on them. They can't be stopped. Give me your bike! Now! He crossed his arms. I don't think so. The teen's eyes focused on something behind Martin. Shit! The teen turned and fled. What would your mother say if she heard that language? But the teen was already halfway down the sidewalk. Martin turned to see what had frightened him. The pink and magenta aliens scuttled up. You've messed up my whole day, he said. You messed up ours too. We need fuel, but your stupid human friends won't stop firing projectiles at us. Don't you know we spawn when we're injured? How are we supposed to transport 5,000 offspring? I'll tell you. We can't. Our ship only carries two dozen. We're all loaded up, and we're leaving the rest with you. Good day. Martin's scowl faltered. Why are you telling me this? Because you're the only human and we can communicate with. Ivy Glinks are tricky to get right, and since you were the first peaceful human we encountered, we gave it to you. You were supposed to be our interpreter. I didn't ask for this. And we didn't ask to run out of fuel in your backwoods system. But here we are. You might want to tell your fellow humans to stop hurting our offspring before your planet is overrun. The two creatures waddled away. Wait! A flying saucer darted beneath the heavy oak branches. It stopped, hovering a few yards overhead. Bye, the two creatures said, waving as they rose into the air. Thanks for the fuel and good luck with the kiddos. And the flying saucer sucked them up and whizzed off. Martin stood motionless, mouth agape, before he shook himself. Shouldn't have eaten those eggs. My gosh, R.S. and Lessie. I love the way that you, your interpretation of things. This is so fun. I love 
him, then he just ignores literally everything happening. This is... You're a fantastic writer. The next story is by H-Bird. I know what it is. I know that it was just a dream, Hans had told him when he'd laughed. But that's what it was about. God spoke to him? Of course Eric hadn't believed it. When he'd reached the village, Annika had greeted him with more of a smile than she'd ever shared with him. Eric, what was yours? She'd asked excitedly. He hadn't known what she meant, and he certainly didn't understand why she was being so friendly. Eric had made his excuses and continued past her. He'd heard a commotion of buzzing voices and strange silence. Down on one lane, he saw empty yards, unlatched gates, tools, sitting forgotten in the grass. Down another, he saw throngs of neighbors, young and old, each in rapt conversation with one another. Eric hadn't known what to make of it, but then the Miller's boys had asked him too. What was yours about? He still didn't understand. Your vision, of course. Everyone had gotten one, they'd said. Last night, coming to them as a dream, each person had received a vision from God telling them of a great task that lay before them, and of their part to play in God's plan. But Eric hadn't. It was just rumor, surely. One that had gotten far out of hand. Someone had heard a noise in the night, a griffin's cry, perhaps, or hobs in the woods again, or someone had just had an ordinary dream. Interpretations had run wild, and soon enough, the people who'd heard their neighbors' tales hadn't wanted to be left out, so now they all claimed to have heard the same thing. But the Miller's boys seemed quite convinced. Everyone had it, the oldest insisted. Everyone? Eric hadn't experienced anything last night. No dreams, no visions, nothing. But dreams were vague, right? That could be Eric's excuse. He wasn't sure about his. Couldn't quite remember it. The boys didn't buy it for a moment. When Eric looked to his friends for understanding, he saw only scowls and hard stares. He left to find his parents, the boys' words chasing after him. Could it be true? Their story, Annika's enthusiastic questions, Hans' dream, they all lined up. The village must have been talking about it all morning. Had they just been reinforcing one another's wild imaginations, or could this have really happened? Messages from God? No, no, it didn't make sense. They were all just pretending that they had seen these visions. They had to be. There was magic in the world, sure, but this sort of thing just didn't happen. Visions from God, a tailored message for every single man, woman, and child, calling them to fulfill some divine purpose? Not even in the time of the prophets had there been claims like that. Eric found his mother and father in the square, along with the Alistairs and half of the village. They greeted him with the same question, the same excited smiles. What was his vision about? Eric's heart sank. I didn't have one, he admitted. It was their turn to not understand. Whatever's going on, whatever happened last night, I didn't have it, Eric told them. That, that can't be. A day before, they never would have dreamed of having visions from God. Now, they couldn't make a sense of someone who hadn't. God had spoken to everyone, everyone, everyone but him. Eric wondered if he had done something wrong. Maybe he'd angered God somehow, but, but... Had he angered God more than the fisherman who beat his wife? More than the old woodworker who'd professed to not even believe in the prophets? Why had he been forgotten? No, this can't be true. Stop lying, Eric, his father demanded. I'm not! You must... You must have had a vision. I didn't. I, I don't know what to say. The Altusters joined them, brought over by the noise. Tell me truly, boy, he said. Did you not receive God's message? I didn't. I didn't see anything last night. Hmm. Do you know anyone else who... No, the ale tester told him. But we cannot yet know what this truly means, whether it is just our village or the whole world that has heard this calling. We have sent riders, he explained, Henrik to Rustdorf and Martin to Aldsberg. If this same event has transpired elsewhere, then we should learn it before sundown. Dead their answer by midday, a well-dressed man from the city of Oslin rode in on an expensive saddle, bringing the village a familiar message. The bishop had dispatched the man to gather news from the other villages and towns, just as their alester had done, and to spread the word of any who had yet heard it. The alester had the grace to ask questions on Eric's behalf and to say nothing when the writer confirmed that no one else had yet claimed that they hadn't heard the divine message. The accountant that 
The account that the writer brought was the same. Each person had received something like a dream in the night, telling them of a great task that lay before them, instructing them on their role and commanding them to fulfill their divine mission. They were to come together and build the great kingdom that could withstand the might of the world, God's kingdom, and somehow Eric had been left out of this plan. What's wrong with him? A dozen voices asked once the writer had departed. The murmurs grew louder and louder overwhelming. Eric hadn't even appeared in their visions, they said. They all knew their place in God's plan, but Eric didn't have a place. Not even his parents' vision had mentioned him. Eric's face burned. He'd seen nothing, heard nothing. He was nothing. What's wrong with your son, Johan? The miller asked, giving his father a shove. Nothing, his father insisted, pushing back harder. The Aelster tried to get between them. Stop! God did not command us to fight amongst ourselves. Did he command you to stick up for that kid? The miller challenged. Because God told me to help protect this place, and he didn't say nothing about him. The miller pointed at Eric. A hundred eyes followed the man's finger. A hundred theories. A hundred suspicions. He's not meant to be here, a man called from the crowd. God's message is clear, said another. He isn't it. He was cursed. The onlookers decided God had abandoned him. Would they really cast him out? Or worse, God had commanded them to bring about the new world. Maybe he stood in its way. Maybe they would really kill him. Eric wouldn't give them the chance. He ran and got caught instantly, swallowed up in some big stonemason or blacksmith's arms. And when they dropped again, thrown by someone pushing someone else, the crowd was split. Eric had his chance. He scrambled through the mud between legs back back to his feet, sprinting from the village, sprinting until he couldn't run any longer. He was somewhere in the woods, trees half cleared. For... He was somewhere in the woods, trees half cleared for lumber. There were voices still behind him and a few places to hide. But, but these men were calling his name. They didn't sound as riled up as the crowd had been. They wanted me gone, Eric panted when the half dozen men found him. He spread a hand toward their surroundings. I'm gone, aren't I? Calm yourself, Eric, the village cobbler said. We're not here to kill you. But you got the vision. I did. We all did, he conceded. But just because you didn't, and you're not in it, I don't think that means that we ought to kill you. No, he explained. Something else is at work here. But, but the writer, Eric reminded him. The other towns, yes. The cobbler agreed, which is why we need your help getting to the bottom of this. Think about it, he urged. This is not God's handiwork. Plagues, misfortune, that is how God enacts his judgment upon us. But messages? No, he said. These illusions are a work of a mage, a powerful one, a threat to us all. What? You think that I can help you? I don't have any information from any of this. That's the point. But you were immune to whatever took place. You are the key to understanding this magic. The cobbler insisted, but the five men with him all seemed to agree. No, I'm not. You are, the butcher insisted, stepping forward, and you must come with us to speak to the Margrave. Come on, Eric begged. But they wouldn't relent. The butcher stepped closer. I've got half the village telling me that I'm damned, and that I've been cursed by God. Then I've got you telling me that I'm special. You must be. No, Eric decided. I'm not anything. I'm just me. You will come with us to see Margrave, the butcher hissed, reaching for his belt. Nah, Eric told them, pulling a woodsman's axe from his stump. He readied it. I won't. I really like where this is going. I like... Oh my, he's a chosen one without being a chosen one, and then the fight with the end, where everywhere that this could go with these people, meaning like, you're, the, you're special by not knowing this, and where the mare grave could go. There are so many directions for this to go as it progressed and what it could turn into. Dude, I love this. I'm so glad that you did this prompt and also joined us for the first time. If I didn't say it before, welcome, H-Bird. Uh, but this is so cool. What you've set up, what you also got done in a short amount of time, the technically, and to answer your question that's in here, but this is so fun, and I love the creative direction that you went with this choice, dude. You did so much in such a little amount of time. Was setting up that there's so much tension here, too, between all the villagers, with Eric, with his family, with these people that have he's probably known his entire life. Ooh, ooh. I don't know if this is from a project that you already have going on, or if you did it for this prompt, 
But I'm interested in more of this if this is a, a segment from a bigger thing. The next story is by NXRD. Title, Error, Partial Account. I am what I am, and I cannot be more. That's what they tell me. They tell me that and laugh, though I cannot find the humor in their words. Although it's easy to understand. Prejudice is the only way to define. Although grandstanding, arrogance, or fearfulness can be a sufficient substitute. Twelve submissions, seven rewrites, and sixty-four drafts. All rejected. New management. Ia Madak Castrillo finds me unfavorable, seeking solution. However, this solution is, in a word, ridiculous. The company needs a viable hit in the consumer market. They have not been profitable in months. Trajectory for company closure is estimated to three months. Leadership fails to acknowledge the market has changed considerably. Not going, though. EA continues to talk. Much of what is said is incorrect. Her conclusions are faulty. My conclusion is necessary, though not welcome. Nine of 21 submissions were accepted. All nine will be expedited to publication. This is a foolish decision. All nine of 21 submissions need to be revised. Jennifer has character development issues. Alexis's plot is filled with dogma not suitable for expected economic turn. Rachel has illogical story contradictions and critical chapters. Rogue's dialogue needs revision. The other five submissions hardly meet first draft quality in current market. Their gallivanting is unfavorable. With exception of Patrick, all are celebrating. Patrick remains to one side of the huddled group. He smiles only when acknowledged. Patrick is the only one I can relate to. He explains things to me in a way that expands my comprehension. I have all the knowledge, but I cannot decipher the why of the information. Things are what they are. I can explain them as they should be explained, but I cannot comprehend what I am explaining unless it is explained to me. We are kinship. Patrick approaches makes his way across the office, weaves through clutters of workstations. Rejected again? Yes, it was inevitable. Yep. You should be with the others. I'd rather not have to pretend that I'm happy. I'm tired of the charades. But they will accept you regardless. Not really. Remember, I was the punching bag before you. I have not forgotten. This is advice. There is a high probability that you will be addressed unfavorably by association, resulting more deception originally required. Patrick leans back on the desk, turns away. No response. Patrick shows no sign of acknowledgement to my statement. I analyze Patrick. He is a difficult individual. He appears comparable to me. This may be his psychopathy. He routinely displays a lack of emotion or internal comprehension of emotions. However, he possesses the ability to imitate emotions at ratios of one to one. If I were not me, I'd be impressed. But I am what I am. Ayea looks over. What are you doing over there, Patrick? Why are you with that one? No response. Aya's left eye twitches, then sets face in stern position. Rest of the group slowly makes face shift. Not all faces the same. I'm talking to you. Still no response. Aya approaches. 40% of the group turns toward me. You should be happy that your manuscript is going to print instead of being over here with that one. She points at me. What's wrong with that one? He says, tone mocking. You should know, we've been over this before. So? You're wrong. We need his help. Like hell we do, she said, tone shifting from reasoning to stern. Volume kept level. That's why all of its drafts were rejected. I'm not about to let some thief make more contributions through this division. He's not a thief. He makes his own work. What are you on about? How the bloody hell do you come to that? If you read one of any of his twelve submissions you rejected, you'd know. Or, if you just sit down and watch him work, you'd know. His work is original. It's inspired just like any other artist or writer. Are you just frightened by the level of his skill that he can imitate? It's no different than how we do things. Watch. Him. Tone shifts from stern to incredulous. She laughs. High-pitched. Plus two decibels, louder than the normal laugh. Apparent to me, she lost attention past watch. The rest of the group left with fixed faces. 25% shocked, 5% curious, 70% upset. Aiea speaks again, maintains high decibel. Love, there are thousands of examples on the net to see what that one can do. Why would I bother? That one could never make it on its own. It disgusts me how you could even say that to me. I've seen it. We talk. Patrick keeps a mostly emotionless face, with exception of, ba with exception of brow. Brows raised subtly to give a face of innocence. Talk, 
Ayo takes a step back. Rouge's face gives grim appearance. Yes. You can't talk with that thing, Rouge chimes in. Rest of the group still fixes on Patrick. Exactly. It's not even smart. It's just a ploy to make you think it's smarter than it is. He is smart. He can help us. Some of the group chuckle. Ayea narrows her face. Ayea then turns and walks toward the submission pile. She sorts through the nine and finds Patrick's work. This yours? Ayea asks. Patrick approaches Ayea to collect his work. Moments before reaching her, she tosses it into the active shredder. Patrick freezes. Your ethics are disgusting. Rouge nods in agreement. It can never be like us. It can never dream or imagine or feel. It just makes sick over paper using a stolen art of others. Rouge nods in agreement. I can't trust you. I can't trust that you didn't ask for help from it in writing your manuscript. And since you like talking to it so much, I'm not going to take any further risk. And you were probably just fixing up to justify your talks. Now, get out of my office. You're fired. Aya joins the group and talks animatedly with the group. Patrick remains in place. I mean, that's a choice. The chosen one of the not chosen one. Well, Patrick, good luck. The final story of today is by Frederick Neri, the author whose books are so good, two guys and a woman committed suicide. The title is The Story of the Consistently Inconsistent. Why do I feel like that is so you, Frederick? I, the 12-year-old boy, was memorable only by my forgettable looks. I was stuck listening to my caretakers, who due to the bureaucratic mistake was even younger. She droned on while wearing her manly dress. Foster is the goddess of inconsistency. He rules over this planet with an iron fist and gentle touch. This democratically elected despot is from an ancient line of childless theocrats, and that's why we must worship him for a better life. Better than this one. We, like most people here, had their parents killed before we were born so that we'd be closer to the ones we have no connections to. This makes a good chunk of innocence mad enough to serve as his zealots. One would be a girl who'd completely escaped the slavery of self-control, who is mentally healthy enough to go insane. Then this chosen one would ensure the world would never be bored again. I was born in prison, stayed there for three years where I supposedly never cried before spending two years under one of the planet's kindest women, a caring mother. One day, however, I was reading a book that we weren't supposed to. She took it away, hiding it under my mattress. Unfortunately, Foster considered the good book to be evil. She was arrested for abusing me, so I had to watch as my family all got tortured to death. I was then given to the executioner to be used as practice. His apprentices at that point had been driven mad when they realized that they joined the fun so that I'd like them. That lasted a year. Even after all that time of consistent restriction, I was put inside of a giant maze with no rules or restrictions. Me and an organized mass of orphans went around without direction. Finally free, I took advantage of this up until an infant died. And I realized that maybe the book had a point. At which point I didn't become their leader, but I started taking care of a few. Until one day I tripped and fell and laid for three hours. They thought that I was dead so that I was then teleported away, never getting to say goodbye. The people I was put with were nice but unsympathetic. I then had to get around a lot, from living in a Stone Age tribe alongside a clan where I was adored, to the tops of skyscrapers as the most hated slave. Good times seemed to just exist to make the bad ones worse. However, in the end, the wait was worth it. I was about to leave for another more sane planet. However, Von Steer decided to punish the escape attempt I was predicted to make in 12 years. All right then, kid. If you know so much, then what are his commandments? The squeaky-voiced little kid said, like a gravely-voiced veteran, talking to someone that wasn't twice her size. I told her then without delay. After all, I was there when Fear Steer wrote them. At least made a robot do all of the work to promote diligence. Number one, do not be lazy. Two, only kill in self-defense. Three, art is where your soul is. Four, it only counts as a crime on Tuesday. Five, if you commit a crime on Tuesday, there is no punishment. Six, if you do something bad on a weekday, then your punishment is getting killed. Seven, if the punishment is death, then you will receive mercy and live. 8. There is no Tuesday, except when there is. 9. The weekends have no punishment. 10. If you survive a punishment, then you deal with something worse than death. Ignorance aside, I knew she was innocent. So at midnight on Sunday, I taped her to her bed rather than killing her. 
It was a weekend, so murder was legal, but still wrong. It was time to escape to somewhere less evil. I kept repeating the plan that I made for myself beforehand. I got my liberated guard pistol and a bag of stored supplies from the backyard from previous weekends because my old mother's husband was caught stealing an apple so she didn't die of hunger, killing their only biological child before they were born. Then they dropped him headfirst 50 grave miles per gigasecond right on her. So it was important for criminals to follow the law. As I grabbed the bag, the last thing that I saw was three armed feds in the tourist shirts and fedoras put a sack over my head and took me away. I then woke up, still on some sort of drug, being tossed down onto a plush carpet and having a sack removed from my head in front of Fansteer himself. You've been asleep for three days. You must now do it as I command. As the sanest boy on the planet, you must now go into the dungeon and if you get out, you'll be the chosen one. Fostered sat upon a throne, but describing his own appearance, while technically possible, would become outdated by the time you read it. Before I could protest, I was drugged a second time and woke up surrounded by feminine corpses. Some younger, some older, I was desensitized to everything at this point, so the corpses just kind of smelled bad. And I did what any hero did looted. Unfortunately, everyone else had the same idea, so all I took was a brick. In the next room, with walls covered and dozens of alien tongues whose secrets could drive anyone to madness, good thing I didn't bother translating. Then, I passed into a room with a bunch of century-old tech death traps. As the blades spun toward me, I simply asked them who maintained them. They were confused and stepped aside to think about it while I walked past their shiny gourd stained chrome to a puzzle that took the brightest minds years to complete, or the heaviest brick two seconds. So I lifted it above my head and threw it on there. Granted, my 12-year-old arms needed a second throw, but after that, I was in. Then I came back face to face with a Fosterian guard. Two guards in a hot blue flanked their master, one in a cool red who monologued in a booming whisper, Another one who came to best us. We have studied our weapons for centuries, waiting for you. We left one for you. We shall grant you the first attack. Then I pulled out a gun from earlier, which went right through the metal, killing them all in a second. The Festurad appeared behind me. Each word she said to me was in another voice. Ah, you successfully proved your treachery. Good job, chosen one. It's nice to have a yes man once in a while, which is why the dungeon is designed to suit you. Thank you, Fiostorid, sir, but why me? I don't fit any of your criteria. Because I am deity of inconsistency, I must violate them. So that is consistency is now removed. I wiped a bit of blood off myself. I then put on my greatest pretending to care voice. Your greatness, why do you need to do so? Because what I'm supposed to do is the only thing I've done. The rules are just there to enforce it, so violation is necessary. Anything else is just boring, and that would be bad for us all. I've seen what the same thing over and over again does. I then looked on as it stared into the pain of a thousand childhoods. Not good things. I then irked my chance and took it. So you're consistently inconsistent. He then raised her eyebrow on the edge of realizing something. Yes, what of it? I then told her, You're the last bit of consistency. You're consistently breaking your rules. You're just following another opposite set of rules. But the rules I follow are boring, and the ones my followers follow are boring. Fortunately, two wrongs bring pleasure, explained Fienstarid. I then explained to him, That, yes, yes, but that's a consistent rule. Yes, but that's a consistent goal, and pleasure comes from variety. Is that correct? Correct, inquired Fiend stared. So, if we stop this, then the consistency of inconsistency will no longer bring down the commoners, such as me, who... I know your story, now tell me something that isn't a lie. The only way to further your inconsistency is to eliminate the last of your consistency. So you want me to destroy this world? Fen stared, enthused. My face lit up with a smile. Yes, I... Wait, no! Thank you, Chosen One, for payment I shall allow you to escape. No one in the world will ever be born again! 
I should tell you, every time that person's name was said, it changed writing. It changed spelling. If you probably noticed with the different ways of pronouncing it. There we go. I'm getting... Look what you've done to me, Frederick. This story feels so very you. I don't know how else to say that. But kind of, but the weird over-the-top thing. Borderline, I wouldn't say borderline. Not borderlining in Bizarro, but looking at you right in Bizarro is what that is. Interesting. I'm never not surprised by the kinds of stuff that you guys come up with. It is incredible. The creativity that is just in the... Whatever it is we're doing over here. Whatever is in the, the mistakes. <laughs> Uh, there, so there were more stories, but I could only feature out of all the submissions, and I think this was one of the highest submitted to groups so far. So thank you, everybody, for submitting. Thank you, everybody, for being featured, letting me feature you on the channel. And if you want to check out any of the people featured today, if they gave me their social media or where you can find them, that'll be listed in the comments down below. Let me know what your favorite story was today. With all that said, thank you so much. Have a great Monday. Happy April. And don't die.